Mandate. What's up, family? Welcome to Mandate, where we talk about issues pertaining to our people and in particular to our men. This platform is about having open talanoa around certain issues, but also look at ways where we can refine who we are as men, unlock our true potential, and take charge of our lives. Um, my name is Charles, and I'm one of our um, co-hosts um, this evening, and that's my brother, Betia, a.k.a. Mad Messenger, who will be introducing our amazing guest this evening. So over to you, Pete. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Charles. Hey, we've got, a, we've got an awesome guest tonight. Uh, we're a very privileged and honoured to have him tonight. A uh, very uh, well-known and renowned man and speakers himself. And so uh, he is, a, well, he had a, a, a policing background, uh, having joined the New Zealand Police as a cadet. Uh, straight from high school, and he served as a police officer for over 25 years, and with the last 15 of those years, focused on developing and implementing successful youth strategies. The success of his, this work caused him to, to be recognised as a leader in the field of youth offending, and his reputation has opened the doors for him to advocate for Pacific youth in a variety of education forums. Uh, he has a depth of understanding of the link between education and the youth gang culture. His success, the success of his team led to the New Zealand Police using uh, a model as a blueprint to develop a further community projects nationwide. And he sees, sees that from his experience of the police, he understands the importance of being a reliable team player. He also respects the concept of being under authority and acknowledges the importance of loyalty. Whilst managing these projects, uh, he was often called upon by government and community agencies to assist them with matters ranging from staff training to school talks, he has also had the privilege of representing New Zealand at the highest levels in, in his field. And on these occasions, uh, it was a keynote speaker at the South Pacific Chief of Police Conference in Nauru, uh, and also the 16th World Youth and Family Congress in Melbourne, Department of Justice. Uh, he's also motivated by a desire to see all youth, no matter what ethnicity, offered the, the tools and opportunities to succeed in life. However, because of his Samoan heritage, yes, Samoan, it is always a little more special when he sees Pacific Island youth excel. He operates out of his own definition of the word integrity, i.e. doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. As awards, uh, in 1996, Police Silver Merit Award, 97, the Rotary uh, Paul Harris Fellow Award, 98, Queen Service Medal, uh, 2000 North and South Magazine, named one of the top 100 Kiwis of the year. Oh. Uh, 2006, Mayor of Auckland, one of six recipients of the Living Legends Award, uh, roles after police, uh, the Ministry of Social Development, Manager of the Pacific Youth Development Project, uh, Te Wangana or Aotearoa, Pacific Engagement Advisor, uh, also Parenting Place, Pacific Presenter, and currently he is the Pac uh, Pacifica Director of Family First New Zealand. Welcome to the show. Nick Tuitasi. Bonjour. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> hey, sorry, Nick, just, just very quickly. Um, so I, I do realize we're still on, uh, on lockdown and I know we're still on alert level three. And I know there's certain steps with alert level three. I know it can be a bit confusing, but uh, we always ask um, the guests that, that, that have been on the show thus far on Zoom, um, how, how, how has it been for you in terms of mentally? like this time around during lockdown. And, and so I'm talking more like in terms of your mental state thus far in, during this lockdown. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, for me, lockdown has been awesome. And I'll tell you why. Um, many of you would understand that, you know, when you're a busy man and you are doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things, you've got a whole lot of plates spinning. Um, you're going around putting other people's fires out. And when you actually get locked down, you've, you've just got no... You don't have to come up with an excuse why you can't help people out. Mm -hmm. And it just helps you just to be still and then know, you know, that God is God. Um, mm -hmm. And the beauty of that too is there's a whole lot of stuff that um, you sort of put into maintenance mode. And you think when I get some time, I'll, I'll get around to this, um, you know, Bible study and <laughs> prayer and fasting and all those other things that, you know, you just ignore because you're just too busy. So the lockdowns for me, two things happen. One, I get closer to God and two, um, you start to do a lot of, what is it? I suppose maintenance or restoration on, on family relationships because you are constantly on the go. You, 
you're hurting people's feelings, um, but a lot often they don't sort of think it's important enough to raise. Then, of course, when you're sitting looking at each other for 14 hours a day in the lounge, you know, something will pop up. And of course, we introduce the local at seven o'clock every night. So that's where my family is <laughs> right now. Oh. Um, that's all good. And um, after the local, you know, the Holy Spirit's convicted you of something and then you bring it up and next thing you know, everyone's crying. And then when, when it's all finished, you go, oh, God turned up. Hey. So yeah, those are the sort of things that I look forward to in lockdown. And plus my garage got tidied and the garden's looking a bit better. So yeah, no, lockdowns for me are, are a good thing. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome because I think some of the other guests, uh, one of them particularly said they felt it quite, quite hard this time around uh, mentally. But it's good to hear that you, in terms of a lot of it, has to do with, with your faith, um, um, Nick. And so obviously, because you're you're a very busy man, you're out and about, uh, and um, obviously when uh, outside of lockdown. Um, but how is it in terms of like obviously mentally? But in terms of you saying the family has been really good and and in local and in prayer. But in terms of because you look you're still looking good because I'm I was thinking more mentally, but I'm thinking you're still looking good. So what have you done like, in terms of? Because it looks like you've been doing some extra training. I'm um, like, I don't know. What, have you? Have you? Or you just, well, just the health buzz or eating or? Well, you go up as a family to uh, Rosebank Primary School and you just go around the you know the field and uh, try to keep away from everybody that's not in our bubble. But uh, yeah, the whole family gets up there. We try to do it every second night, um, or we try and get up there in the morning. And we sort of act like those balangis that are sort of running around. We were just walking around fast. And one time, Nicole and I stopped and had a coffee at the at the coffee um, caravan that we're selling in the car park there. So I don't know if you can call that training. It's just uh, it was just a break of getting out of the house eh, and, and doing some stuff together. Nice, nice. No, that's cool, Nick. It sounds like um because while we're still on um this area of lockdown and family. Um, how important, because it sounds like you've got a routine, how important is having a routine um, for um, for your sanity and also for like just putting in stuff for your family to make sure that the, I guess the rhythm in the, the household is still feeling more and still running smoothly? So my response to that is, um, my game plan is this, you know, men are the shepherd of their family and the shepherd's job, much like, you know, Christ's job was three things protection, provision, and guidance. That's the job of a man, protection, provision, and guidance. Mm. And so um, when it comes to uh, these sorts of things, you've got to sort of take control with the support of your wife, just saying, hey, hun, here's some things that I think we should do. Let's reintroduce the seven o'clock local, you know. Um, let's try and eat together at the same time. Let's and So, you know, bring these suggestions and they go, yep, that's cool. And you might find that your kids might drag their heels thinking, oh, no, you know, we're not going to have a local every night, are we? But funny thing is, it started like the very, very first lockdown. It started like that with the three girls dragging their heels. Uh, and you know my girls, Charles. But, you know, within two or three days, then they just couldn't wait. Because of what happens when you, you, know, you sit at the feet of God eh, and you just open up and be honest. And next thing you know, there's some stuff that he reminds you of that, you start thinking, you know what, I'm not that good a person, really. And then you start confessing, and that whole sort of vulnerability um, and openness actually takes, um, I believe, family relationships to another level. Eh? I think it's important. I think the reason being is that I'll give you an example. There's times where my girls have said, Dad, it wasn't so much what you said. It was just how you said it. Mm. Now, if I'd said that to my father, you can tell me off, but just watch what you say. <laughs> I'd be waking up next week and the doctor <laughs> would be saying, oh, he's coming around, he's coming around. But this is the, the modern day young people who, um, you know, they've got an opinion on everything, even how their father should tell them off. And um, and you just got to work with that, because eh? basically that's how it works. So, you know, after local, someone might say, dad, you know, while we were praying, this came up and this happened or that happened. And it's not necessarily just me, but, it, you know, there's some issues, you know, when you get four other women in the room, um, things happen and someone said something or you know insinuated something and so there's tension uh, and they're able to deal with that so I want to give a piece of advice to guys when there's conflict in the house it's really the man's job to try and deal with it and if, if, especially if you've got females because my circumstances are you know I've got wife and three daughters and me so I'm totally outnumbered um, and but I still have that role of of being the spiritual head, you know, the, the leader. And so if they, when there's tension, 
when the girls were really young, I, I gave them this example. And I sat our family down, all five of us. I had this fishing spool. I held onto the end of the spool and I passed it across to my wife and I gave her what they call the warm fuzzy, you know? Hey, um, love your hair. <laughs> and then she held the string, you know, the fishing line, and she passed it to Whitney and she said something positive to Whitney. Whitney holds it, passes it to Nicole, something positive, and Nicole holds the string. And you just keep doing this until you've given everybody a positive word. And then what you notice is it's created a web. And so when we had finished with the web, I said to Whitney and Nicole, who are the two oldest girls sitting opposite each other, I said, okay, there's, let's just say there's a bit of um, tension between the two of you. Now pull on the string. And what happened is as they pulled on the string, because it's a web, everyone holding those strings got pulled to the center. And I says, this is an illustration of what happens when two people have an issue. It's not just between two people. Everybody gets pulled into it. And, and you know, it's an example that I've used too when I'm doing staff training and everything else. Like, you know, even in the workplace, there's that one particular person or two people have a fight. So they disappear. One of them comes back in and starts talking to you. The person they were fighting with comes in and says, oh, look, Nick's teaming up with that person. No, we're not teaming up. They ask me a question. You know, and you, you cause those divisions and, and, all, and it, a lot of it's just the way they interpret it. But it's really awkward, you know, how you start to, think oh should I talk to him now because the other person might think I've taken their side you got to get rid of that tension especially in families and um, you got to use you know those opportunities to let the people have a discussion so my way of dealing with it was wasn't always right I was the youngest in my family and this is how my dad would mediate you know my daughters would be able to sorry my sisters would accuse me of something and they knew the the trigger words for my dad I, all they had to say was Nick's being cheeky now it, it was yes I ate the last banana okay but in my dad's mind being cheeky must mean I was trying to look at them in the shower when they were naked or something similar you know so the, there's these, these trigger words that all of a sudden I, I'm being the youngest I was never ever in the right okay that's just the way it is with the older ones you know they're always going to have the first word dad's always going to believe them and so that's what I took into the marriage and of course I had this picking order and it didn't matter you know whose fault it was, if the oldest one was saying it was the younger one's fault, well, then that's, that's the way it was because that's how I was raised. And, you know, I had to knock that out of myself because we bring a whole lot of junk from the way that we were raised and we try to, you know, implement this stuff without um, talking things through with our spouses and all of a sudden you, you can be on the wrong, you know, the receiving end of some real harsh criticism. I'll give you another example. Growing up in Kingsland, and we were broke. And I need to explain this to the team because although I look young and handsome, I'm actually a baby boomer. You know, I just turned 58 um, last month. Mm. And um, what happened was I am first generation New Zealand born Samoan, which means with my folks were the originals that came over right, with a, a you know, multitude of others, obviously. But we were all you know, couldn't speak English, didn't have much money, really didn't know how to go about you know, the New Zealand lifestyle. But that generation did a fabulous job eh, of establishing themselves and buying homes and getting their kids into school and you know, putting food on the table. That generation, man, they, were real, they had real tenacity. The problem is that when they gave birth to us, we were thrust into this Balangi system um, without any navigation from our folks because they left school at Form 2, you know, in the islands and stuff. So unfortunately for me, I was a huge failure at school. And um, although I would you know, I was clever in some areas. I was either lazy or dumb in others. So you get to that situation where with, um, with trying to make you know, uh, a really good go at it, when I look at the end of my school career, which finished at Avondale College in 1981, um, when you have a look at the qualifications I have, which were very few, um, I was a failure in the eyes of man. If someone was doing some research saying, okay, so, you know, why are Pacific failing in school? They could have interviewed me at that point. I share that with you because um, our parents did the very best they could to raise us with the life skills and the parenting skills that they had. But unfortunately, the majority of our Pacific parents all went to the same parenting program in the islands called the Jandal program. And the Jandal was the answer to everything. I, and that was just a short, sharp, I haven't got time to hear what you, you know, what concerns I'm busy, you know, trying to do stuff. And so we were never really listened to. And if 
anything was damaged or broken or you know there was something that went wrong there was never a thing in our vocabulary called an accident right it was someone's being stupid and so someone has to pay for it eh, through you know and so i remember when whitney for example she was about I don't know, 18 months and we were having breakfast at the table and it was the cereal situation where you know i've poured the milk for her all her life at that point and uh, she wanted to have a go herself and this is her at 18 months trying to hold the bottle and, and pour and so she spills it and you know i said daddy do it daddy he's no i do i do so she has a go at it she spills it and so i yelled at her look what you've done you know and Vasa was in the kitchen doing something she looks across and goes well, well, what's wrong what's wrong i said she spilled the milk <laughs> and she goes yeah it was an accident have you never had an accident i went um no <laughs> no i haven't actually that that's stupid as far as i'm concerned that's that's how we were raised you know so we actually had to sit down and have a really good look at um which parenting skills are we going to use and um and so you know it was only by god's grace that uh, you know, i had to take the humble road and say okay so what do we do how do we do it and what are the new you know perimeters and as a result of that you know i guess the girls had a decent run at life hey eh? because we discussed things. We decided we're never going to ask, argue in front of the girls. And so, you know, for the many years that we raised them, if anyone had an issue, it'd be, um, you know, can I see you in the room? And normally that was Vasa saying that to me. And the girls would go, ooh, dad's in trouble. But, you know, they never saw us arguing in front of them. We always took it to the room and stuff. So I'm just passing on these little tips that I think, you know, will help guys, especially when lockdown, where um, you're constantly in, you know, in touch with your spouses. I know when I was in the police, that one of the busiest times for police officers when it comes to domestic disputes is during Christmas, because mm. that's when companies shut down, factories shut down, and couples have to look at each other and, <laughs> and discuss things. And it's amazing if you haven't got those skills, you know, to communicate and fight properly, you've got problems. Wow. Oh, man. I took some, took heaps of notes on that one. <laughs> oh, short, short, Nick. Um, what, so, because I know how difficult it is to like um, the way we were parent parented, and we go into um, when we start having children ourselves, um, we often um, parent the same way that that we were parented, and um, and it sounds like you know you've done an amazing job in terms of like evolving. Um, and you've given us some tips in terms of like um, making sure you sit down with your with your wife, your spouse, and really nut that out. Um, how difficult was that there? Like, oh, it was really hard because we've all got egos, you know. Yeah. And we all come from families who think you know we've got a handle on this, you know. Yeah. The funny thing is, no matter how um, how ugly your background was, you would think. To yourself, you know what? I'm never going to parent like that. Mm. I'm going to do a <laughs> yeah, job, true. you know, until that blood hits the back of your head. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you sound like your dad. Hey, mm. I want to give some advice to the guys too. Um, there's this word HALT that I use as an acronym H A L T, as in stop. And there are four times that I believe men are vulnerable and dangerous, you know. And the first one, the H stands for when they're hungry. The A stands for when they're angry. The L stands for when they're lonely. And the T stands for when they're tired. Mm. When a man is hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, they're vulnerable. It's just one of those things is enough to set us off. But if you've got two of those things operating, or if you've got three of those things operating, you're extremely dangerous. Mm. And so it's important when... You know, you, you get into a situation where you're heated. I constantly look at myself thinking, okay, so am I one of those four things? Not that, you know, any of them are wrong on their own. It's just that when we have that niggle, you know, when our, we have one of those things going in the background, you don't have enough time to concentrate on what's actually being said. And so it's extremely important that you catch yourself first of all and realize, okay, I'm two of these things, so I've got to be extra careful how I how I walk through this, you know, conversation mm. or in this situation. Eh? And one of the things that I've learned is I've learned how to apologize because that's a skill that a lot of our men struggle with. Eh? And 
the thing about apologizing is we, I think it's part of our human nature how we never want to be wrong. And even if we are wrong, we lie. No, so it's something that men have to deal with, hey, and we just have to be real about that. So um, I want to share a scenario with you guys, which really illustrated to me because there's a when I married my wife you know, 32 years ago, I wanted to make her the happiest woman in the world. You know, I wanted to make sure that she was just smiling. That I wanted her to realize that when she, you know, leaved and cleaved, left her parents and came to me, that she made the best the best decision of her life. So when I see her crying, I realize I've failed. And I think to myself, man, I've just, I try my hardest not to make her cry because, you know, it's just the stupid things that sometimes men do. And we can be really childish about some things. So I want to give you an illustration. The men will, will probably appreciate this because it was while I was in the job and I had this young cop that I was training and we were working the eye car in Avondale we got sent to a job where a mother had rung up to complain about her two sons fighting in the kitchen. And it was in Mount Abbott Road. So we went speeding along and on arrival, we, we got in through the front door because nobody answered the door. But we found this, one of the brothers lying on, the, on his back and he had eight stab wounds in his chest. And we could hear him breathing, you know, that... that <laughs> Down. So I was thinking, oh my goodness. Now we know first aid, so you put you apply pressure. But between us, we had four hands. He had eight wounds. And so, you know, we're trying to stop the, the bleeding, and there's no sweeter sound than that siren of the ambulance. And you're in that situation, man. Long story short, my, my offside and I got split up by CIB. My offside had to go in the ambulance with a detective to get one of those dying declarations. And I had to stay and drive the detective who was doing the scene examination. Well, when Robert finished the scene examination, he said, okay, Nick, we're done. Let's get back to the office so I can write all this up. We went to leave, we closed the door. We drive halfway down the back to the Avondale station. And um, he goes, oh, drats. He used a different word, but he goes, oh, drats. Um, <laughs> I've left my notebook at the house. So I said, yeah, no worries. I spin around, we go back. And when we go back, the door that we locked was now open. And we walk in there and there's the brother who's the offender. Um, he's been hiding under the house the whole time and he could hear us walking around the top there. And so when we left, he thought, oh, good, I can go back in. And we catch the offender. The reason I share that story is because when not my wife says to me, honey, you've hurt me, or when I see her crying, she doesn't have to say the words. I just know that I've hurt her. I've punched her heart or I've broken her heart. I remember that particular scenario where if you come across a situation where somebody is bleeding, where somebody is hurt, you stop the bleeding. You don't sort of stand back and go, well, if you hadn't done this, <laughs> I wouldn't have done this. And, you know, and they're bleeding out right in front of you. Mm -hmm. So my advice to people is when your wife says to you, honey, you hurt me, apply pressure to the, to the wound and say, sorry, honey. I'm, I'm sorry I hurt you. I didn't, you know, just be absolutely honest. Don't try and justify it, but just stop the bleeding. Allow them to sort of tell you, you know, why they're hurting, how they're hurting. And sometimes, you know, it could be a misunderstanding and that's cool if you can sort that out later. But don't try and justify anything that you've done, especially if you're on the wrong, because all you're doing is you're allowing that, that your spouse to bleed out. Eh? So, I hope you understand the scenario there that when I see my wife, you know, I've punctured her heart through something stupid and I click off and I said a water into a, one of those things, you know, and she says, why do you hurt me like this? And I just realized, okay, stop the bleeding and say, sorry, honey, it's because I'm an idiot. And I really, you know, I, I, I'm sorry for that. And that's all they need. It's, they just need someone to take, I believe, nine times out of 10 responsibility for their silliness as opposed to trying to justify it and saying, like, I'm the man, I can do what I like and see how that works for you, right? Eh? That's so cool. That's so cool, Nick. Because there's a lot of gold nuggets right now, um, Nick. I mean, just, just you sharing in terms of um, uh, for couples that are married, but more so for our men. But, I, but I'm also thinking, thinking about our young men as well, Nick. Because I know you do, you've been, you do a lot of stuff with uh, young people. And um, and so I was just wanted to ask you, like, with our, our, our young men, because I need to hear this, especially from, from someone like you. Um, 
What, what do you think is the state of uh, our young men? What, what, what do you think that a lot of us, I don't know, maybe is it because of the system? Is there, what, what do you think is the common recurring theme or issues that a lot of our young men are, are facing, Nick? Okay, so one of the things that our very young people, so I'm talking anyone still at school, okay, or maybe even 20 and under, one of the biggest issues I, I have with the young people, as much as I love them, is they are so scared of um, being wrong or they're so scared of not following the crowd. Hence, they'll, um, first of all, some of them live in a bit of a fantasy land too where they like to post things that are looking good and so, you know, everyone thinks that their life is perfect um, and then if somebody doesn't like it, then they remove it because it's all about getting the approval of others. And I think it's important for us to say to them, you know, you've got to be your own man. And even though everyone else is going a particular direction, if it's not right, don't follow. Mm. So my advice to the young ones is my favorite psalm, Psalm 1, which goes, you know, blessed is the man who doesn't take advice from the wicked, who doesn't stand in the way of sinners, who doesn't sit in the seat of mockers. There's three things that our young men have got to be careful of. Don't listen to wicked advice, you know, bad advice. Secondly, don't follow the sinners in the crowd. And the third thing, be careful of being a mocker. And the mocker in particular pertains to the church. Mm. And, um, you know, the church is the bride of Christ. So those are the three things that you don't do. The two things that you do do in verse two, it says, but they delight in the law of the Lord and they study it day and night. So there's two things that you have to do is you have to delight in the law of the Lord and study it whenever you get a chance. You know, they say day and night. I'm saying whenever you get a chance. And delighting is a little bit different from just doing. It's for, for example, if I say to my daughter, hey, mum's been working hard today. Please, can you guys clean up after dinner? And they go, yeah, yeah. So they're going to obey me. But then they go there and they start banging the dishes. <laughs> so no real delight. It's, it's important that, you know, when, when we do delight in the law of the Lord, it's we follow it because we know it's true and it's right. Mm -hmm. What happens then if you delight in the law of the Lord, study day and night, four things happen. It says you will be given prime position like a tree by the stream. Secondly, you will be a fruit in season. Thirdly, you will, your, withers, your uh, leaves will not wither, as in you won't stress out. And fourth, you will succeed in everything you do. My advice to young men, is the first three things, avoid. Two things, engage. Four things will be your benefit. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, that's so cool, Nick. Because you're right, I think a lot of our, our men, and um, like even, even in the churches, a lot of our young men are kind of go through certain struggles and certain issues, and, and you're right in terms of um, they're seeking the Father and spiritual aspects. But I'm just also wondering about like some of the, the the young guys or the young men or even the young boys who are not not in church but just rural uh, and in bad environments um, or bad up, up, upbringings and all that kind of stuff. But what, what do you say to, to, to how do you, what do you think some of your advice for, for those kind of uh, those men? Okay, so basically what happens is I would advise those guys to to set up for themselves some values right? Some good values. And that's why my catchphrase to a lot of the young people has been do the right thing at the right time for the right reason. If you always do the right thing at the right time for the right reason, you'll very seldom get into trouble. The only time you're going to get into trouble is if somebody's trying to stitch you up or somebody's trying to do, um, you know, has got it in for you. And I think, and don't think that nobody will. Hey. So for those young guys, what it means is do the right thing is if you do the right thing for the wrong reason it's the wrong thing if you do the right thing at the wrong time it's the wrong thing all three things must be aligned and uh, if they practice that for example so do the right thing at the right time if they're at school and the teacher goes pens down please or, you know and the the student might be thinking no nah, i'm doing my work you know i'm carrying on doing the right thing 
but at the wrong time, okay? Mm. Then what happens is they happen to be walking along and the, an old lady needs some help and they think, oh, I'll give them a bit of a hand. Why? Because they might give me some money. Okay, it's the right thing, but the wrong reason. Yeah. So, you know, if, if our young people create those, those values for themselves and start just doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason, we'll find that they'll... Um, they'll avoid getting themselves into all sorts of trouble. The other thing too is it's really important to choose friends carefully. You know, the old saying, hard to soar with eagles if you hang out with turkeys. Mm. I've seen lots of young people end up in prison because they were trying to impress their mates. Mm. So it's really, really important that you choose your friends carefully because your friends can you know, take you to the two places. One is prison, the other is parliament, and there's criminals at both. <laughs> that is good. That's a good one. Um, that's a good one. Oh man, because I know you've done so much, so much work uh, with uh, work. Like you're saying you in the span of twenty four, over twenty five years. Hey, I am Nick. At least, yeah. Of course, and, and also how many how many years now with um, working with um, with young people now? Well, the funny thing is that even though you you know you you leave those particular roles and you'll probably find this yourself is that parents still ring you or parents still <laughs> ring you and say hey my kids you know now playing up and you know please can you come and talk to this person or somebody at work's daughters run off you know can you help so you, you end up just you know, once in a while you just get dragged back into helping young people and and to be honest i don't actually mind they eh? it's one of those things where it doesn't happen too often it used to happen quite a bit you know just left the police I was working with MSD and you're beginning all these things. You know, oh, someone's clamped my tires. You know, please, can you come? And I can tell you back in the day, and this is the thing about being first generation New Zealand born, okay? Back in the day, there weren't very many police officers in Pacific Islanders. I've been back to speak to the, you know, the Pacific Island police officers a couple of years um, in a row, probably about five, six years ago. And I, I start off by explaining to them, if we had a Pacific for North or the Island cops, the year that I joined, we could have probably had this meeting in the men's toilets, you know, because we would have all fit in there. But I'm now talking to like 160 officers, and those are just the ones who could get some time off to come to the, you know, to the Fauna. And I'm, I'm so proud that there are so many of them. But here's the problem when you've just got about a dozen police officers, and um, our island people look to us as Pacific people who have made it in the white man's world. Mm. so if they have an immigration issue or if they have a civil matter or if they have something in any of the government departments they'll come to you because you know you're a police officer and you're involved in the government so they think you can fix their immigration issues or their car that's been repossessed or the and for our pacific people we want to help them because that's just what's written in us in our dna the trouble is a lot of our cops got into trouble for overstepping the mark and the only reason we overstep the mark is because a lot of the Baalangis don't understand that we as Pacific Island officers, we're going to meet our ahinga a lot more and a lot more regularly than the Baalangis do. And I know this is quite general, but back in the day, you know, I'd work with Baalangi cops and I'd say, hey, you got any family? Go, oh, yeah, I've got a brother. I don't know where he is, you know. And I'd look and think, oh, I've only got one brother. I know where he is, you know. Oh, we're going to be meeting at funerals. We're going to be meeting at birthdays. We're going to be meeting at church. We're going to be meeting at forms. We're going to be meeting all the time. So if somebody comes from, from Buss's family, for example, comes and asks me, Nick, please, we're trying to get this, you know, for this and that and everything. And if I say, oh, look, sorry, you know, I can't do that. Every other meeting I have, there's that guy who thinks he's, you know, the prime minister can't do anything useless eh? so, so you know you know those uncles and aunties eh, who ask for a favor you know you can't do it but you overstep the mark next thing your boss is calling you and goes nick we'd like to know why you rang immigration and told them that you you know you were a police officer <laughs> and you go, oh here we go so you know it was a lot of pressure on us early island cops back in the day eh? because we love our ainga and loved our people we did our very very best but that's how some of us would get into trouble trying to help navigate some of these things with our people. Wow, I, I can I can imagine that. I can imagine some of them are still doing that. Um, some of our, our family members are still doing it. And, and, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh wow. I can remember the the old days, say where 
someone say, oh, yeah, go down and see Nick. He's the big man down there, at, you know, Avondale. Then they get there and they see me with my broom because I'm the cleaner. Eh? But they, but they really talk you up. But uh, yeah, no, he's the big man at immigration. He's the big guy at, uh, you know, Fisher and Paykel. And <laughs> you get there and hey, he's not the big man. Well, he might be big, but it's just because he eats too much. Oh, it's cool. Um, Nick, you got quite a extensive experience in 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 serving our people, um, from youth development all the way to parenting, um, and even to what you're doing now. Um, what what we the question just went on my head. <laughs> Why did we talk about that? Um, you're probably gonna ask me, why didn't you go into modeling? <laughs> yeah, I don't, right. oh, yeah, what, what, why, what, what was your inspiration or the heart behind wanting to serve our people or do the work that you do? It's a very good question. I guess at the end of the day, um, one of, I suppose when I went to join the police, it was a real desire, but I didn't have the qualifications to get in. And not only did I, have, I did not have the qualifications, but I didn't have um, the physical fitness. And, you know, I've shared with many that I failed the written exam to get in. I failed the physical exam to get in, yet I was still chosen. And I realized that, you know, it was a privilege that God had given me the opportunity to get in there. And for the first 10 years of my career, I had thoroughly enjoyed it. And, you know, any opportunity I got to help our Pacific people and, and those sorts of situation I did, but... Then when, you know, I got railroaded really into the youth aid work and I realized just how our current system in the police was failing our Pacific people. That's when I, I thought to myself, man, there is actually a better way of doing this. And through a series of only, I can only say miracles, through a series of miracles, um, I was given the opportunity to try and pilot a program. And when I piloted it, and I started working amongst our Pacific people, it made it really real to me just how much struggle street <laughs> they were on. Eh? It, was, it was really, really sad. So um, I was fortunate enough to, you know, to be born into a family where you know, I shared a bedroom with my brother, which made my brother and I you know, really close. But I was now working with families where kids didn't have a room. You know? They were sleeping in the lounge, but they had to wait till everybody's finished using the lounge and then they could go to sleep in the lounge and then that would be one or two in the morning then they had to go to school and you know foot it with the rest of those clever kids and, mm. and i started to see that there were so many um we we started so far behind the start line and so from then on i i just felt any opportunity i got to give our pacific a bit of a nudge you know to help them up or to do anything because you know I, I was born in the island family, but privileged, really, because of the way, you know, our parents were able to find their feet and, and get on with business. But um, I know that there's so many others, you know, there's, for example, if you look at the lockdown, if you've got two families in a three-bedroom state house, lockdown's no fun for those 13 people, eh? Mm. You know? And so if the Palangis, they're thinking, oh, you know, and I don't mean to be racist, but I'm just saying this is they've got each of them got a room and you know they can all go to that's why the palangi idea of you know time out works but when the people say hey go to your room and go oh, can you get out of the lounge then because that's you know, <laughs> you know? it yeah. doesn't work for our, our people eh? so uh yeah i when i started to see how a lot of our people were suffering uh, my heart really went out to them and i mean that's if you notice that all my jobs have been pacific related mm. and um, a lot of it is, you know, it's community stuff. And I remember when I left the police and then when it's the MSD, when I f finished MSD, I said, right, that's enough community. Just make me rich, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, you just can't help it. It's because I think God just keeps steering you to where you can use your skills. And we are just the tool in his hand. And I'm not a particularly bright tool, but we're the tool in God's hand and he takes you where you need to be. And so when people, will come up and thank me and say, wow, you did a fantastic job or good on you for this and that. I said, look, don't thank me. I'm just a tool in the hand of the master. If wow. you take your car to get fixed by the mechanic, when the job is finished, do you go and thank the spanner? 
you know, you thank the mechanic. Wow. Uh, you know, I'm just the tool in, in God's hand and he'll take me where he wants me to be. That's mm. so powerful. Man, that's so good. Man, we're living in a day and age where a lot of people are looking for progression, looking for development, want to be the person in the community. And I'm guessing you never chase that, but um, how do you keep yourself in check that you're not trying to make a name for yourself, but you're actually there to um, serve the people? Like, what keeps you humble? Are, are there people around you mm-hmm. other than your wife that are always like, hey, that's bring exactly, it down? Okay. That's exactly it. Two <laughs> things. One <laughs> is my wife. She can sniff pride, man. She's got a <laughs> nose for pride. And when I say something, she'll look at me sideways going, uh, what did you hope to achieve by that statement? <laughs> I hate that, eh? Because um, sometimes, you know, it just slips out. Um, but the other thing too is I have friends that I meet with um, and I constantly knock things around. And there's this one particular old fella by the name of Trevor McLeod who was one of the early um, pastors of, of Elam when they started Elim in Auckland many, many years ago. Um, and he rings up a few of our guys when he, he lives in Algiers Bay. He comes to Auckland. He'll contact a few of the guys, uh, Michael Jones, Joe Funga, Irani Clark, Willie Hume, myself, and say, hey, let's go for a coffee. And we will sit there and for two hours, your last questions. And, uh, you know, there's, you can't really lie to guys, eh? <laughs> 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 you know, when you're looking at them in the eye and you're asking those hard questions, it's really hard to lie. So, you know, we can just be honest and say, okay, well, I'm doing this or I'm going here and they'll ask, why are you doing that? You know, it's, it's that having that um, father, in the, father in the faith, being able to sort of bounce ideas around. So one of the things I honestly believe we're lacking today are more fathers of the faith. Eh? We've got a lot of, you know, babes in Christ. We've got a lot of, you know, men in Christ. But fathers of the faith are very few. And that's because if you're a man of God and, you know, for example, Charles, if you came to me with an issue and I told you to harden up, you know, because that's how a man of faith would do it with a scripture to back it. But when you speak to a father of the faith and you've got an issue, then he says, son, come walk with me. And then that come walk with me is where the answer is. But not a lot of people want to do the walking with people at the moment. They just, they'd rather have that, you know, harden up instead of come walk with me so i have two or three young people that i've said to them come walk with me and i've walked with them for two three years still had them you know i'll have a coffee with them to catch up to see how they're doing and um it's just important that you you have two or three people that you can keep an eye on and, and mentor so to speak but um they become friends at the end of the day and it's all good stuff that's so cool. Good, good, what, yeah, this, this, this is a good point, um, Nick, because I'm wondering, yeah, why, why is it? Why is it that, that, like you said, fathers of the of the faith? Why is it this? It's um, like you're saying, and it can be easy for for me to say, you yeah, harden up, just you know, just come on, just yeah, just just do it. But what, what, why is it? Why do you think it's it's harder for for men to, to kind of actually be an actual father of the faith and walk and talk to some of these young men? I think there's two reasons, and these are my personal two reasons. One is because we don't understand the Good Samaritan story. Mm-hmm. And two is because we don't have that um, long-suffering ability. Um, and so, you know, with the Good Samaritan story, just quickly, you know, the old story, the guy went out, found a guy that the Tongans had been, and sto- um, <laughs> had been robbed. The true story and, is true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know the priest walks over the other side the levite and then finally the good samaritan that samaritan was the enemy of the jews so jesus used you know the enemy to be the hero in the story but there's three things that the samaritan got so i'm not going to go through the teaching but i'm just going to explain there's three things that the samaritan got from doing the job properly from loving this neighbor tired late broke Tired, late, broke. Tired because he let the donkey, you know, the guy ride on the donkey. Late because he had to stay at night because the guy was unconscious. Broke because he gave two coins. Those two coins, according to research, is two months accommodation at that place that that guy. You know, and we don't even do two nights accommodation for people, eh? And the key to that whole thing was about loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Nicodemus says, well, who's my neighbor? Mm. And that's how the story came about. We have to love people with extravagant love, extravagant love. Two other things that people don't pick up in the story because they don't fully understand 
um, the the uh, Jewish context is that the reason why the priest crossed the road and went the other side is because in Deuteronomy it says if you touch anything that's dead, you're ritually unclean for you know, mm. 21 days. Now, I don't know if you get paid or not when you're standing down for 21 days, so maybe he's thinking I'm too important. I can't, you know, uh, touch the guy. The Levite did the same. And the story, what Jesus is saying in that story is it doesn't matter how important you think you are or how busy you are. If you come across somebody who needs love, give them love. And the the second thing too is that the reason why he paid you know that money was because the guy was robbed he had no money so therefore he was unconscious that's why the guy stayed with him and when he if he was to wake up without that money being there he wouldn't be able to pay his debt he would then be a slave to that innkeeper mm. so in paying that it kept him and the the good samaritan even made himself vulnerable was saying if anything else you spend I'll pay that as well. That's to make sure that the guy wasn't a slave. Now, how much love is that? Hey. And so when you get guys who come, when I get guys who come to me and ask for me help, I start thinking, okay, if I'm not tired, late, or broke at the end of this process, then I probably haven't done it properly. Mm. Fire up. That's so cool. Ooh, some golden nuggets there. Um, Nick, you. I read uh, like an auto bio on you um, online and it talks about before you became a cop, um, you're sort of on the wrong side of the law as a youngster. And one of the things that um, this talks about, there's a series of events that sort of happen, but also you, you recognize that there was mentors in your life that um, helped you like turn around. Um, and we're living in a time like the term mentor um, it's not, it's like a thing of the past. And um, what does having a mentor mean to you and um, how important it is for, for other men to have that same relationship, like of a mentor and a mentee? I think it's important because, you know, I've been blessed to have a series of people along the line. And so I liken it to people who um, give you direction are like signposts on that road of life. And so you don't need to take the lamppost with you. You just need to know the direction to walk. Uh, so you might have a series of people that you would call mentors, or then you might have someone that walks with you a little bit longer. Um, the, probably the very first person I would consider was a mentor to me was my brother. So my brother was seven years older than me. And um, just very quickly, referring back to the you know, my old life, um, he was training at Knox Theological College at Otago to be a minister, Presbyterian Church. And at the same time, I was living in Auckland with my family. And um, because of the, the group that I was hanging out with, there was a bit of a, a, a street gang. Because, you know, every, every school had a street gang back then. And I was, I was on the fringes of... A, of a group at Avondale College. I, my brother Doug came back from um, for Christmas with the family uh, and everything was sort of shutting down. And I was about to go out at 11 o'clock at night, you know, like I'm still at school. And uh, he says, where are you going? <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm sort of going to meet some friends. And he goes, at 11 o'clock at night. I was going, um, yeah, wish you weren't here, you know. <laughs> it was easier to sneak out when you weren't here. Um, and we got into a bit of an argument. And, um, and he says, man, you got to be careful. And, and he was sort of saying, you know, you could get yourself into some real strife and stuff. And I was going, oh, look, you know, I'm big enough now. I think I was all of like 16, you know, to make my own decisions. And I, I went up to um, the school where my mates were waiting for me. And I could hear, it was back in those days, all beer bottles for glass you know so you could hear the clanging of you know, the bottles and everything and uh, they i was late because i'd had an argument with my brother and when i get there they're all you know eco with me going where you been man now the thing about these little gangs you know you, you've got your own little click and then there's always somebody in those gangs who wants to sort of take you down a peg or two and when i arrived because i was late and they were you know they were angry and they said oh what are we doing oh there's a party in new lynn I was, oh okay let's go so we all start walking across the field to get onto rosebank to go to new lynn and i just started getting this really heavy feeling and that heavy feeling came from you know the argument that i had with my brother and uh then all of a sudden i didn't feel like going to the party which was really 
unusual for me. And um, I thought to myself, but if I say, look, sorry, guys, I don't want to go. One of those guys was going to say, oh, come here, man, you, you know, and have a go with me. Eh? So I was a bit scared that I'm going to have to have to fight, you know, one of these, uh, these guys of mine. Um, so I got to the Rosebank Road and I got, I got up enough guts to say, oh, look, sorry, guys. I know I made you late and now I'm going to ditch you guys. <laughs> I don't want to go, but I'm going to go home. I started walking and I walked really quickly because, you know, they were going, oh, come back, you wuss, you know. I sort of got out of uh, glass bottle throwing distance and then I just ran. And I ran back home. And when I got back into the house, my brother was on his knees in the lounge where we had been arguing and he was praying for me. And I was thinking, I was like, whoa, okay. So I said, oh, sorry, bro, you're not really fat. And I gave him a hug and <laughs> we went to sleep, bro. <laughs> Anyway, about two in the morning, the phone rings. And it's one of these friends who was calling out to me, come back, you was. And he says, bro, um, they've given us one phone call. I said, yeah, well, why did you waste it on me? You know, they go, no, we've got this idea. Can you go wake up your mum and dad, you know, who don't know I'm in a gang, right? Go wake up your mum and dad, bring them down to Auckland Central, get them to sign the surety bail so we can all be released so that our parents don't find out. <laughs> in my mind i'm thinking i could just imagine myself going in the two in the morning you know to my mum and dad's room going um dad wake up can you come and lie to the police or my friends in this gang that you don't even know i belong to eh? <laughs> and then next thing you know you know my dad would be getting locked up for murder <laughs> so uh i'd say to the guys look sorry man i you know i can't do it and um then the next morning i found out after lunchtime when they got out of court that what had happened is I'd made them so late that um, the party was going to end, so they decided to steal some cars to get there. And while they were stealing cars, the neighbors woke up, gave a call, and the cops swooped on them, grabbed them all. And had I been there, that would have changed my life significantly. Eh? Mm -hmm. And so that stuck in my mind. Of course, the very next week, I'm in church, and um, you know, the pastor says, okay, we're going to sing a song. And I get up reluctantly singing the song. But that song really challenged me. So I challenged God. <clears throat> and right there and then, my whole life changed. All the friends that I used to hang out with, I said, sorry, guys, can't do this anymore. And, you know, a lot of those young guys died early. They died young because of that lifestyle. Um, but they were you know, all happy that I'd gone on to do, you know, something significant and join the police. But I look back now at all those guys I hung out with. They had a really rough, rough life. So, you know, having mentors, that was the first experience I had. And then, of course, you just come across people that you respect. And so you ask advice. And a lot of the time, I mean, if the person is older and is wiser, they'll actually help you. They'll use their connections and say, oh, son, I understand what you're saying. I've got a friend who, you know, could get you the job or has got a, is selling the car. or And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, all the dots start to get joined. So mentors and mentees is a good thing. Cool. Wow, what a story, what a story. Wow. And then but but it, with the police, was that something that you always wanted to do, um, Nick? Well, yes and no. I mean, I always knew that I'd, I probably wouldn't have the credentials, eh? Um, but like I said, it was just through a series of miracles that, you know, God pulled the string, but it was one of the things I want to do. Um, yeah, was to, to join the police. I had this one particular guy um that I admired at church, a chap by the name of um, Faleafa, Junior Tolia 4 and he was again sort of like you know a mentor and I was like yeah I'd love to be a you know someone like him and it just so happens that you know God says all right we'll work something out. Wow wow it just, it just seems like God like you're saying just these miracles that you see what God is just ordering every step you know like you're saying that just sharing that story could have been you know, could have been the opposite opposite direction or you, you're a bit of a, at a crossroads and then yep. Look at look at your life. Um, it's just amazing what you've done, and it, within the community and um, and, and the church scenes and and um, in the secular, just uh, amazing, Nick. Um, but I did ask you as well because I know you've done a lot of work with the police and the and youth, but also I saw I remember one time I think you were doing something with golf. Like was that was that you, are you looking for the next uh, VJ Singh? I remember you. Well, what was, was the direction? That's exactly what I wanted to do. It was an idea, and I was. And I was developing that because when I left the police, I didn't really have anything lined up. And I'm thinking, surely there can't just be one Pacific Islander, you know, which was Vijay Singh playing the PGA. Our guys, must, there must be some young guys. 
and you know, people were telling me, oh, it's because it's expensive to play golf and everything. So I thought, man, I'm going to set something up. And I started going down that road with uh, one of the cops who was a member at Mankeke at um, Roscoe. I said, man, let's get some kids together and let's find them. And it was going down that road until um, when I did leave the police and MSD tapped me on the shoulder and go, you know, stop doing that and come work over here. But, you know, that was my desire was to, and part of it was selfish desire because I wanted to play golf myself. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, that never really got off the ground, but it was a lot of fun, you know, dreaming it up. Eh? And, and that's what I want to encourage the men to do too, is like, you know, we were created in God's form and image and God's creation, you know, he's a creator. And a lot of us have the, that um, ability to create, you know, mm. entrepreneurs and others. And mm. so I want to encourage guys to dream and I want to encourage guys to give things a go. And, um, you know, I, I, I've got lots of, great ideas that never really got off the ground but i can tell you something about ideas one good ideas that don't work until we do and two if it's a good idea it will always have its moment it might not be you that does it it might be somebody else and you know one of the other things that just to show you the point one of the other things i used to love doing is fishing i used to love fishing at night and i thought to myself and it'll be really cool if there could be a, a little bell on the top of the rod where because you can't see the rod at night, you know, and if the fish bites, it'll go. And I started thinking about this idea. And then, like, I don't know, I shared it with somebody. And a few months later, you know, China came up with this little bell you could put on the end. Oh, like, oh yeah. I should have moved quicker. So, you know, there's lots of ideas that God will give our young people and our old people that, that, that makes things um, easier for people. But it's the relationships that you form on the journey. Mm. Okay, so you know, that Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples. The correct um, definition of go from the um, Greek word is as you go. So, you know, as you go fishing, as you go to work, as you go on the bus, make disciples of people. So you don't actually have to get up and go to Africa or to China or to India. You could just get up and go outside and talk to your neighbors and make disciples of them, eh? I'm secretly praying for our neighbors um, on either side of us. And either uh, that is the moment we get an opportunity to bring them all together and you know, bring them over for a barbie and then sort of say, hey, I don't know how to get to this from a barbie to a Bible study because none of them go to church at all. But yeah, I'm going to give it a go, you know. And the mm. only reason I want to give it a go is because I don't want them to look at me one day and, uh, you know, in judgment day and say, Nick, you live next to us for how many years and you never said a word about this, about Jesus, about judgment, about anything. I'm going to go, oh, um, yeah, sorry about that. Oh. So I guess my word of encouragement again to our men that are listening, um, when you have a look at how the first five disciples were recruited from Jesus, it's all on relationships. Mm. So in this time of lockdown, it's where our currency is, is relationships. Think of your friends, think of your family, those that don't know Christ, touch base with them. You got plenty of time to do it. You know, ask them some questions about how they're doing and stuff, and then say, "Hey, I need to tell you this: all that we're experiencing here, one day is going to come to an end." Mm. Perhaps I could just share on that a little bit because, you know, <clears throat> I've been loving the Bible studies we've been doing with um, Joe Funger, and he's bringing us up to speed and stuff. And I follow a particular guy, um, Amir, who's a teacher in in Israel, but. He, he pointed out something really interesting, which I want to share with the guys, just to give you an idea of how close we are to the end times. Eh? So <clears throat> Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says to them, listen, the fig tree, when you see it blossom again, that generation, that generation will see the coming of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we all know that, that the fig tree being Israel, it started to bloom again in 1948 when they were given their country back. The people born in 1948 are currently 73 years old. That's the generation that's going to see Christ return. They, that whole generation, none of them will, will all die until it's been fulfilled. So we look at that and say, oh my goodness, if that's the truth, what are we meant to be doing now in the last few minutes of the game? This is not the last days. This is the last few minutes. Oh, wow. and you know when it comes to a game when you're losing and it's the last five minutes you play that game a little bit different from the way you play the first 75 minutes and you look to your veteran players to get you home hey mm. 
grow, it's important we understand that we need to look to our veteran players. We need to look to our older Christians and our faith elders, those who know the signs of the times and know how to deal with this, the pressure of this game. Mm-hmm. And we got to stop talking about the rubbish that we, that the noise of the world and the things that are constantly taking our, our concentration away. And we have to make sure that our friends and family know the signs of the times and understand that, you know, any minute now, because the rapture and the return of Christ are two separate things. We haven't been taught that properly. The rapture can happen even before we finish this recording, but the second coming will happen at a particular time, you know, and the Bible spells that out beautifully for us in the Bible, but we have to start reading our word. And I've met more and more guys who, <laughs> who like listening to people talk about the word, but they don't read it themselves. Mm. And so for the last couple of years, you know, we've all been getting back into our word and studying the word and looking for the signs because these are exciting times. Even though um, you're for family first, I bring up issues where the government are bring in, you know, this law and that policy. And, and a lot of that stuff is, is leading us towards lawlessness. Mm. If you know your word, you think, yes, because that lawlessness is meant to happen before because it, it tells us we're getting closer to the return of Jesus and especially closer to the rapture. So I don't mean to get too spiritual on you, but that's why I get excited. That's why I'm so happy. And others are, you know, disillusioned that they might think, you know, that I'm a weirdo. But if you know the signs of the times, if you know your scriptures, then these are exciting times. But mm-hmm. the thing about it is the only thing that's holding back the rapture is the fact that God doesn't want anyone to perish. And if that's the case, then the job for us is to get about our father's business. Eh? And what's that? Well, two simple things love the lord your god with all your heart mind soul and strength and then love your neighbors you love yourself you come across those who don't know point them to the cross you know your job is to sow seeds it's not to convince them it's just to sow seeds it's the job of the holy spirit to convince them there's not one thing that you and i can do that can cause the scales of the eyes to fall from the unbeliever that's the job of the holy spirit what our job is to understand the gospel and then like the sower in chapter 13, go out and sow the seed. Sow the seed of the gospel and then walk away and then allow the Holy Spirit to do the rest. Wow, that's so beautiful. Um, man, we, no qualms, um, um, Nick, in terms of, we love it. I know you said that you mentioned that people might think you're a weirdo and all that kind of stuff, crazy. But no, we just, we appreciate, we appreciate it. even you just sharing. It just seems like you're sharing us, sharing a, a sermon or devotion. It's, and it's, it is beautiful just to hear that um, the word of God. And obviously, it shows your passion as well, uh, a lot of passion behind it. Um, but also as well, um, Nick, was there a time where you felt like, was there, was there a time where there, you felt there were some several hardships, some real struggles, with, even with the line of work that you're in right now? You yeah. felt like, yeah, I'm just, uh, Father, I just feel like quitting. I just, uh, I just had enough. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think what really encouraged me, though, is the fact that, um, you know, that God works all things for good. So I'm going to give you an example of how God had to discipline me. So I'm in the police. I'm making money. I go to MSD. I'm sort of making even money. And then um, all of a sudden, um, I lose my job. I lose my job. And I look at God and I say, so all of this was so that I could be like this, unemployed? But what I didn't understand, and God had to walk me through this for eight months, walk me through this whole process where I could have gone and got another job. But I had this sense that God was saying, be still and know that I am God. I'm going to teach you something. Because I, I suppose I was starting to get a bit too big in my riches, you know, started thinking that I'm, you know, God's lucky to have me on the team, that I've got all these multiple skills and, uh, you know, I'm you know, doing stuff. But one of the, the biggest faults that I had at the time is that, Um, And people might not understand this as a fault, but while I was in the police and I was still doing outreaches, you know, for the church and stuff, I just got to the point where if if I felt God couldn't afford it, well, then I could. And so having that money in the bank and being secure in that sense is is you, you know, God doesn't, you don't look at God as Jehovah Jireh, you know, Mm. your provider. You just look at him as, okay, if you can pay half, I'll pay the other half. (laughs) And and God had to really knock that out of me because it was something I was just so accustomed to. And so what happened was when I lost the job, I had to be still, but there was a, it was 
some jobs or some outreaches that I'd said I'd go to and I was happy to go to and I had money. But then, of course, when I had no money, all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, now how do I get around this? There were four particular things that God did, and I'm not going to go into them now, but if anybody wants to know, man, you know, contact me. I'll be happy to share it with them. But there were four significant things that God showed me. Oh, yeah. He took me overseas and he showed me, you know, he was, he loved me elaborately. He provided everything and it was with no money. I had no money. And each time I sensed God was saying, okay, you see what I just did. Do I have your attention? You know, and I finally, about after the fourth thing, I said, yes, God, sorry to be the fear bots, you know, sorry that I, I thought I was all that and you are Jehovah Jireh. And from that point on, money was never an issue. And as I started to go into projects and stuff, I knew that if it was God's will, it was God's bill, he would provide. And um, that's the big lesson that God had to teach me, stop being self-sufficient and stop trying to, you know, be God to everybody. He's the God and I'm to follow. So yes, Mm -hmm. in those situations, when things got really, really hard and really, really tough, it was because God was trying to teach me something. And I want to encourage others when things get really tough, stop look up and go okay father what's going on here you know did i let go of your hand is have i gone off and done something that looks good but not god you know the difference between good and god is one oh (laughs) sometimes you don't see it so true damn really encouraged thanks um nick man um, just want something else I wanted to touch base on because I've seen you in different um, platforms where you've spoken, spoken in a, um, like a church setting or spiritual setting. And I've also seen you um, speak in a secular setting. And we're living in a time where everything's like, you got to watch what you say, you got to be politically correct. Sometimes you have to wash down what we want to say, beat around the bush. But every time I've seen you, have always been a straight shooter. You've told her how, how it is, but you've also, um, you're, you, you're able to be straight, but it invites the audience to listen. You force them to listen, and then they can take away what you said. Like, um, what are you seeing today in terms of like the, the state of the church, the state of the uh, Christians, and, and especially with the work that you're doing, because it's, it's quite controversial and it's not it's not between those who believe and 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 in the world it's like the churches are compromising themselves at the moment like do you want to touch base on any of that (laughs) sure okay so everyone needs to understand that there are two churches there's the universal church of believers and then there's the local church that we attend and the there are some members in the local church that are part of the universal church but then there's a lot of tire kickers that are there they come because they like the music or they like the social, you know, social events and everything else. And so those people still need to hear the gospel. And it's important because, unfortunately, um, there are lots of different versions of the gospel. When I get invited to speak to churches and they, I ask them, what would you like me to speak on? They say, oh, bring a gospel message. You know, it sounds awkward, but I have to say, okay, can you explain to me what you understand as the gospel message? <laughs> and they go, exactly. And so... Um, I can only tell the truth, you know, I can only speak um, the gospel. And one of the funny things too is that um, I'll share this because it's it's another lesson that God taught me just only a couple of years ago. When I go and speak, I I try to be all things to all men and I try to be funny or I I try to, you know, um, command respect. I try to do all these weird and wonderful things. And then one day God, taught me something he said to me you know that you robbed me of my glory I go what do you mean and you know this was an audible voice it was just in my spirit he says well when you get up there and you tell jokes and you tell stories what you're actually doing is you're shifting the eyes of the people to you and they're taking the eyes off the gospel and and you know basically saying Nick nothing you can say can cause them to believe Because again, like I said, that's the job of the Holy Spirit. So when I give you an opening, go and shed the seeds of the gospel. And if you get them admiring you because of your your funny or your this or your that, then you're robbing me of my glory. 
And I was thinking, oops, <laughs> you know? So when I now go and speak, especially in churches, I give them the pure gospel. And the pure gospel is, you know, all have sinned. The wages of sin is death for God's loved one. You've got to give them those things because, you know, it's about believing in Christ, but they need to understand why they believe in Christ. And so I share that gospel message when I go and speak to the bride of Christ. Now, I believe that the bride of Christ is not ready for Jesus to return. Our offer was all Maasai and Papa, really dirty, you know. We actually have to get our act together. And it's important that we, we do that. So, yeah, there are lots of um, pastors who are starting to wake up to that. And through our you know, Pacific Wave, which is the Pacific arm of Family First, we we're holding some funnels, you know, through the, uh, the year where faith elves were coming and they were coming in, you know, good numbers. We put on a feed and then we explained to them that these things that are coming now, these lawless laws that are coming, it's all part and parcel um, of the gospel. And they need to wake up to the fact that this is happening. So I want to encourage people to find a church that actually preaches the gospel. And I know it's easy to go to a church that where you can get entertained and where you can, you know, um, I don't know, look the part and, and everything else. But it, it doesn't help because, you know, Matthew 7, 21 tells us that on the day, they'll be coming to Jesus saying, but Jesus, you know, we this, we that, we did this and we did that. And he says, get away from me. I never knew you. It, there's a lot of people who, you know, who know Jacinda Ardern and can tell us all these beautiful things about her. But if she was to come on Zoom, could she look and say, oh, hello, Nick, hello, Charles. <laughs> you know, she doesn't know us personally and we don't know her personally. And sometimes we get caught up in the fact that, you know, and, and it's the same with God. People can say, yes, I know of God and stuff. But, you know, if God was to enter the room, could he actually say, hey, there you are. It's important that, you know, we as a church get that sorted. Mm, wow. Oh. Shut Nick. Because I'm just sorry, Nick. I'm, no, so good, well, I'm weary of time and um, I'm weary of your time. And man, I, we could go all day and I'd love to like sort of touch base on different um because you're well known with um in terms of like fatherhood, especially parenting three girls. And um so we could go do a whole thing on that. Um <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just, oh, uh, like if you could like give like a sentence or a phrase of inspiration to like impart to our viewers, other than what you've already shared, uh, what would it, what would it be? I, I was going to, you know, leave that particular um, definition of integrity mm. as my, you know, a parting shot. You know, doing the right thing at the right time yeah. for the right reason. That's something that I try to live by, and I encourage others, you know, to live by too. Because, like I said, if if you did it like that, you would very seldom <laughs> get into trouble. But if you did get into trouble, it's because someone's looking to get you into trouble, eh? Yeah. And they did it to Jesus and they did it to the disciples and they did it to everybody else and they'll, they'll stitch you up if they want to. But, um, yeah, I think it's, an, it's important doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason because the right thing you know, is related to righteousness and that brings us right back to just trying to walk in righteousness. And that little phrase that I created was basically for the unchurched. It's, you know, mm -hmm. instead of saying, you know, walk righteously. And I think the other thing too, sorry there's not a phrase but it's a story um is about walking in humility mm. and i'll share the story with you very very quickly that you know when jesus rode in on the donkey and uh, we you know remember it being palm sunday that people put their garments down and they cut branches and they were waving it and they got all excited and they were you know getting going into a frenzy and because they realized you know this is the messiah and as he rode in on his donkey and everybody was cheering you know, you know what the donkey was thinking the donkey was thinking, they love me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important that we understand that we carry Christ, you know, the Holy Spirit and dwells. Wow. And anything that we do 
is because of him. And so when people start cheering, don't be a donkey, you know? <laughs> don't start thinking that they love you because it's, it's the Christ in you that, they, that they're actually admiring, eh? Because, you know, it's more of him, less of us. Wow, that's so good. Don't be the other other word of donkey, eh, um, Nick? I know what you're saying, you're right. Absolutely right, man. Oh, oh wow, so powerful. It's very powerful. Thank you so much for tonight. Um, Nick, I, I think when um, hopefully the alert levels go down, we'd love to have you in the studio. Like, and and, um, and just, it would just be a, a great experience just you being here and meeting all the other guys as well. Um, oh, it's awesome. But um, just thank you so much. Um, also, thank you very much. Uh, Charles, you want to say anything, Charles? No, I just, um, just want to honour you, Nick, with the work that you do and you continue to do. Um, you're a pioneer and a pillar um, in your community and also our Pacifica community. And I've, I've sort of um, followed like your career for a long time. You never knew me, but just, you know, when you have pillars in the community, you sort of are forced to look and, and, and observe and, and so I'm just real privileged to cross paths with you, um, just continue to cheer you on as you sort of be a spearhead for us younger genera- gen- gen- generators, us younger generation. And um, and it's good to, we talked about mentorship because I've been holding on to this email. I've been wanting to send you for a long time, uh, but we can, um, you, so you'll probably get an email soon. Uh, Hey, well, bro. Um, I'd love to coffee with you. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Found me a mentor, guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just, yeah, thank you so much, Nick. And uh, thank you for this time. And I can't wait to catch up again and have you in the studio. So yeah, my law so far. Thank you so much. Thank you, bro. I've just got four words for you. Refine, unlock, and take charge. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Nick. I'm sorry, Nick. Is it? Is there anyone that you want to call out? Anyone you think that would be um, beneficial to, to have on the show? Mate, I reckon my brother-in-law, Ronnie Clark, you know, Savia Tama, would be awesome. That he'd uh, come and share some wonderful um, insights and stories. And I've always admired him because he always gave me his old training gear. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, getting a little bit tight now since the lockdown, but uh, <laughs> you uh, know, I'll, I'll actually give him a buzz, bro. And, oh, awesome. Thank uh, you so much for that, Nick. Yeah, Ronnie. We'd love to have you on the show. It'd be awesome. Thank you, Nick. But hey, Nick, every guest that comes on the show, we, we always give them a, a gift. And so we want to gift uh, we want to gift you this. And so the reason why I'm just kind of jotting down stuff, writing down stuff, is just a recap on what we talked about, what you've shared. And so I just I did a, a quick uh, caricature of you. And I know you love your, your golf. Um, and I know you love your fishing. But I, I, I just want to quote you just before we I, I show you the, the gift. I want to quote you. Uh, and this is on, I think it was on stuff.co.nz. New Zealand, and you said this, uh, I think they asked you a question, but you said this, I'm a believer in faith and getting a second chance. I don't know where I would have ended up if I hadn't joined the police. A lot of my friends, and you, you, you've already mentioned this, a lot of my friends from my youth are either dead from too much alcohol or behind bars. So I'm happy with that. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with what I got and the work isn't done. Uh, and though I'll, I'll just, uh, the work isn't done, though but i'll just keep on going and keeping on going and so and it's a t- true testament of, of, of who you are and you just and you are even now you, you keep on going and, and you in terms of the work and the and, and your belief and your faith um and so like charles said we honor you and it's been a privilege and an honor to have you on, on the show and so this is for you my friend a caricature of you and your and your golf stick oh wow that's awesome he looks younger though <laughs> you made me look a bit more like Brad Pitt there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, you're, you're better than Brad Pitt, bro. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's wonderful. So, thank, yeah, you, no, so. awesome. uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much. So, when the alert was go down, uh, Charles and I will, will gladly drip, come by and drop it off to you, um, Nick. Yeah. And have a, awesome. coffee. Yeah, have a coffee. Yeah, yeah have, have a coffee. Yeah, that'd be awesome. But thank you so much for your time once again. Uh, my Lord, lovely so um, Also, thank you, bro. Yeah. And God bless all our men. All the best. Sorry if I offended you. Mandate.